Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's make some noise for Jesus in this place. He's the one that deserves it. Woo! Danny, he, he embarrassed you there, hey? But when well, you stood up, you turned around. Have we got any bids? Have we got any bids? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Hey, listen, grab a seat. We can get straight into it. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and so much to, uh, for allowing me to share just a part of my testimony, my story is so far with you. Um, man, I just believe God uses the, the real unlikely, right? And so here I am. And uh, it's a privilege. Like I said, these guys are phenomenal. And I've just got to know you this weekend, but I have been blessed so much by just being in your presence and not just being in your presence. There's so many pastors that just talk the talk, but you walk the walk and you're building it. And it's just phenomenal. I'm excited for you guys. I'm excited for what God is continuing to do through you and what he is about to do. Uh, Like (laughs) we always hear, the best days are ahead. Um, but just looking around this building, this room, and the new auditorium that I got a glimpse of, man, this is going to be like a hub for South Africa. I believe that in Jesus' name. Can we honor your pastors? It's good, man. All right. Uh, if you... Uh, didn't know, I, I, like I said before, I've been married for 15 years this year. We celebrate it. It's going to be amazing. Our best pull something out of the bag because it's got to be good. I missed her birthday. She was okay with that, but I best make it up when I get back home. You know what I'm saying? This is my wife here. If we've got a picture, her name is Joanne Marie Watson now. And then these are my three little children that we happily produced. And um, <laughs> in the middle is Isabella East. Uh, on this side here is Jude Jensen. And on this side right here, the cheeky little monkey, his name is River Romeo. We gave him R&B names because we want him to be superstars and make us a lot of money in Jesus' name. (laughs) Listen, I want to preach a message that uh, blessed my soul, so I hope it blesses your soul. And I want to preach a message that I guess has been uh, a key in my life throughout the years in helping me continue, continue to overcome things that I face in my life. There's this guy in the Bible, his name is Gideon. Anybody heard of Gideon? Gideon, and you see him in in the book of Judges, which is in the Old Testament. And uh, Gideon's there, and God speaks to Gideon. We'll have a look, we'll take a look. Judges chapter 6, here we are. Uh, Verse 14, it says, The Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? Time out, one second. This is like the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one who put the stars in the sky and the grass on the earth and created all these beautiful animals. This this Lord is giving some instructions to a man and then the man has the audacity to question if God knows what he's doing. How many of us have been that man? (laughs) That we hear a word from God or we read the scripture and we go, God, that's great. But are you sure that's me? (laughs) Are you sure you're right on that one? I'm not too sure. Gideon is like, pardon me, Lord. I don't think you've got this right. Listen, I'm the weakest in all of my family. (laughs) And he says, the Lord answered, but I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You've got to hear a word for you today that the Lord is with you. That whatever God has placed on your heart, whatever the scripture is that he has placed in your life to come alive, he is with you. And it is not you that he is just sending, but it is Christ in you that he is sending. So you are able to come, whatever it is that you are about to face, whatever it is you're going through. Because if the Lord has said it, then he will do it. And so Gideon, I'll give you the, the story. I'll just, I'll just break it to you. Gideon then gathers a big army. He gathers 32,000 men. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of people. 
that's a lot of people. Like, if you're going to go and fight a battle, you want to go with 32,000 men. No one's going to mess with you. If I had 32,000 men in London, no one's messing with me. If I had 32,000 people in Atlanta, no one is messing with me. And so Gideon gets 32,000 people on his side. He is rolling deep. And so he gets this army, and then God says to him, you've got too many men. He's like, what? 32,000. This, this army, this Midianite army, by the way, the Bible describes it. It was so large, so big, that it was like counting grains of sand on the seashore. There were just way too many that you couldn't see the end. You couldn't see where it finished. There were so many of this opposition, this enemy, and Gideon only had 32,000 men. And then God says to him, yo, that's too many. You don't need that many. Drop it down. So Gideon drops it down. He says, drop it down again. And so he drops it down, 31,700 men. So he is left with 300 men. And so Gideon starts at this place, the Bible describes it, a place called Herod. And we're going to look at three places tonight. One of them is the place called Herod. He gets to the place called Herod, and then God says, uh, do something. And so Gideon goes there. He gets to another place called Hill Moray. He faces the army. He defeats the army. He drives them out. And then Gideon and his 300 men rest at a place called Beth Barah. Have you got those places? Yeah. Herod, Hill Moray, not Harrods. That, <laughs> that would be nice. Harrod, Hill Moray, Beth Barat. Gideon defeats the greatest army that's ever been seen at a place called Harrod, Hill Moray, and Beth Barat. Have you got it? Are you taking notes? The Bible says 90% of the time you get to heaven if you take notes. 0% of the time. <laughs> so let's take a look at Harrod. Harrod means this. Harrod means a place of fear. Harrod means fear. Gideon and his men have camped at a place called fear. I wonder in your life if you've ever been so scared. I was talking to the guys the other day and I was just divulging as we were becoming family. I was saying I was scared of something and then they laughed at me and looked at me in disgust. And I just wonder if I could share with you vulnerably today and share with you my, my fear. Is that okay? Okay, I am petrified, and when I'm in petrified, I am petrified of cats. <laughs> All right, we just broke some trust right there. You laughed. <laughs> I'm petrified of cats. Like, if a cat is coming my way, I'm crossing the road. I'm not even walking across the road. I am running across the road and getting on the other side of the road. Cats are evil. The enemy made two animals. He made snakes and cats. Let me tell you, that's the truth. If you're a cat lover in this place today, there's the door. <laughs> and so... I hate cats. <clears throat> I hate cats, but I remember I was growing up and I was, I was playing rugby and I was the, the wing forward, the flanker in the scrum. So my job simply was to break out of the scrum and just tackle people down to the ground and hurt them. I like hurting people. In Jesus' name. And so <laughs> that was my job. And so I was really, really good at it at the time. I'd probably be terrible at it now, but I was really, really good at it at the time. I'm not boasting. I'm just being honest. I was really, really, really good. And I remember I'm playing this game against this big school, these country boys. And my coach, he shouts out, Watson! Watson! I'm looking around, seeing if there's another Watson on the pitch, because you can't be talking to me, because I'm really good at rugby. And so he goes, damn, Watson, get off the pitch. I'm like, oh. I said, sir, come and step into my office. <laughs> so we walked into his office, and I said, sir, why did you take me off of the pitch? And he says that, and he says, well, you're really good. I said, I know. He says, but the thing is, you can either have a really good game or a really bad game, and there is a definitive uh, reason why. I said, okay, please tell me. So he says, in a really good game, what you do is that you break away from the scrum, you eye up the opposition, and then in a the moment of you thinking, you think if you can take down that player, if that player is not bigger than you and you are stronger than it, then you will go full force and you will take down that player, take him down to the ground and win the ball for the team. I'm like, I know that's what I do. <laughs> he says, but in that moment where you look at that player, and if you look at that player and that player looks bigger than you, and that player is going to hurt you. What you do is you freeze. You begin to retreat. They begin to take ground. And now we're in a sticky position as they begin to win the game. And so, Dan, you froze. And I had to take you off the pitch. I laugh. Ooh, that will preach. So that's why I'm preaching it. 
So many of us in life, we look at the things coming our way, the oppositions, the obstacles, and we think about it in our strength. If I'm smart enough, I'll go at it. If I'm strong enough, I'll go at it. If I've got enough resources and finances, I'll go at it. But when we think like that thing is going to take us down, that sickness is going to take us down, that, that uh, investment is going to take us down, whatever it is we think is going to take us down, what do we do? We begin to retreat. We begin to stop. We begin to live in fear. And we were never meant to stay in fear. It's okay to be fearful, but you were never meant to camp there. Gideon is learning that he is at a place called Herod, and God has told him that you are not meant to stay in a place called fear. I wonder what it is that you're scared of today. I wonder what it is that has been holding you back in fear for too long. It's time to move on. It's time to pack your backpack, put your camping gear back in it, and press on to what God has called you to do. It's time to not stay at a place called Herod, a place called fear, but God has called you for greater and there is more and he is moving you on. But Gideon still didn't believe that the word of God was true. How many of us are like that? That we read the Word. Sometimes we can proclaim the Word. But I can't live it out. That's just a nice fairy tale. So many of us, sometimes we live like that. If we're honest, let's be honest. In our humanity. And so God speaks to Gideon. Again, he says, I know, I know how you're feeling. Let's jump to it. Judges chapter 7, verse uh, 9 it says, during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp because I am going to give it to you into your hands. And if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. Because afterwards, you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley Thick as locusts, their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Verse 13, Gideon arrived, just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the midnight camp, and it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. It took the enemy to convince Gideon that the word of God is true. Gideon had to get up and go. And what was holding him back, what he was scared of, he realized that thing was actually scared of him. Or not just him, but Christ in him. You see, what I've realized is when there is an obedient people that live and walk in the word of God for the things of God, the enemy has to tremble. The enemy is scared and the enemy doesn't want people to walk in the full authority of God. The enemy would rather you think you're meant to stay in a place called Herod. But God is trying to tell you that enemy knows that I am greater than it. Whatever you face knows that your God is bigger than it. I need the worship team to join me. Just the musos for a second, if that's okay. Because I need to just explain some things. <laughs> so he gets to Harrod, a place called Fear, and then this second place. Anybody remember what it's called? Hill Murray. That's why you take notes. <laughs> Hill Murray. Harrod, Fear. Hill Murray. Hill Murray means this, Teaching. God was trying to teach Gideon something in this place. And I'm trying to figure out, God, what are you trying to teach us? What are you trying to teach me? Like, in my life, when I face big things, I, I want to know how to overcome them. I want to know how to defeat them. I want to know how to beat them. I want to know how to press on. I want to know not how to stay in a place called fear, God, but I need to learn something right here. And Gideon is getting taught something. We know the end of the story, right? We know that Gideon wins the battle. We know that Gideon drives him out, and he ends up at that place over there called Beth Barah. But here, God is teaching Gideon something, and he wants to teach you something today. 
But if you ever looked at a result, and then you've looked at the process, and you think, how did that get that? Like, if you ever looked at a couple, and you're like, how did he get her? It blows your mind sometimes, right? You just think, this doesn't make sense. The maths doesn't add up. He must have a lot of money. What's going on? <laughs> sometimes you look at a couple, you look at a kid, and you go, how did they produce that beautiful thing? It's wild. <laughs> like, like we, don't look around. Don't look around. <clears throat> But we think it sometimes, right? How did, how did that get that? How did 300 men be an army so big that you couldn't count them? How? I love understanding processes and methods. And so if you read on in the scripture, we understand the process and we understand the method and what they use to win the greatest battle in their life. And I'm going to give you the tools right now, right here this evening, to win the battles in your life. These are tools that I continually use to win the battles in my life. Whenever I stand in front of a panic attack, I've understood and I put into practice this process and method. Whenever I stand in the face of depression, I understand I put into practice this process and this method. When worry tries to take over me, I understand and put into process this practice and this method, and I want to give it to you today. So the scripture says, this is what they did. Gideon says, follow me, watch my lead, and they get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I do. We're going to jump to verse 29. He says, he smashed these jars, and grasping torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled. And we jumped down. It says, verse 24, Gideon sent his messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So it says... <clears throat> They had three things. Here you go. This is what you need to write down in your notes. Three things. This is how you can defeat your greatest battles, your greatest enemies, your greatest opposition in your entire life. Are you ready for it? They had a jar, they had a light, and they had a trumpet. People going on Amazon right now are going to buy a jar, a light, and a trumpet. They had a jar, they had a light, and they had a trumpet. And they defeated the greatest enemy in opposition of their life with a jar, a light, and a trumpet. Who's got a jar? Anyone got a jar? You got a jar? No? Anyone got a trumpet? If you got a trumpet, God bless you. They had a jar, a light, and a trumpet. They had a jar, a light, and a trumpet. Again, they had a jar, a light, and a trumpet. Help me out. They had a jar, light, trumpet, 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 jar, light, and a trumpet, and with those three things, simply, the enemy fled. The opposition fled. And I'm going, all right, God, that's great. I love that you're teaching Gideon something right here in Hill Murray with a jar, a light, and a trumpet. But in my daily bag, I do not carry around a jar, a light, and I definitely don't carry around a trumpet. So God, what are you trying to teach me? So if we dive a little deeper into the scriptures, we see that the jar represents who? Represents us, represents you, represents me, represents our life. The jar is you. And God is saying in this moment, what did he ask him to do? He says, hey, get the jar and smash it on the floor. How many of us try and keep our jar 
all together. Nice little presented jar. I walk into church and how are you doing? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Nothing's wrong in my life. Yeah, you just had a massive argument with your wife in the car and your kids just like are crying and everything like that. But is it? Keep my jar together. How's your, how's, your, how's your daily prayer life? Oh, it's fantastic. Fantastic. I'm praying seven hours a day. It's amazing. Straight. It's amazing. Yeah, we probably haven't talked to God in a long time. How's this? How's that? How's that? It's fantastic. But God is saying in this moment, He's saying, yo, you don't have to pretend and try and keep your jar all together. You can come in this broken mess just as you are. And guess what? I can still use you. If God was about using perfect jars, I would not be here. But I am a broken, smashed up jar. And yet God still wants to use me to proclaim His glory across His earth. You don't have to pretend God can use your mess ups and your breakups and your heartache. He can use the mess of your life for His glory. He just wants you to be able to go and be humble enough to go, I am a mess, but God, here I am, use me. And so I've learned that I don't need to try and pretend and put up pretense of my life. Yeah, I struggle with things. Yes, yeah, stuff goes bad but I know I'm a broken mess being used by a perfect Lord and Savior. Because when we present ourselves as a smashed up jar, the scripture says we have treasures in jars of clay. When they smashed the jar, what happened? The light, the torch was revealed. When it was all together, it was hidden and contained. But as soon as the jar was smashed and presented like that, the light could be shone. What does the light, what does the fire represent across the Scripture? It represents two things. One, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. That when your life comes just as you are and you go, God, here I am, then God's presence can be shone and His Holy Spirit can be used in and through our lives. When we present ourselves just like that, we say, God, let your presence be known. So they smashed the jar. And then the third thing they had is what? Ba -ba -da -da, a trumpet. In the scriptures, what they would do is that they would blow the trumpet, the Bible says in Revelation, as a triumph. That the trumpet would be blown to show that the victory had been won. But yet Gideon had not even fought yet. He had not even gone into battle. He had not even done anything. But yet they blew the trumpet knowing and declaring that God's word is true. And I may not have seen anything change yet, but he has said it and he is victorious. And I know that God has gone before us. So I'm going to be confident in his word and I'm going to blow the trumpet of my life to declare the victory of God in my life. Come on, if you believe it, give Jesus some praise in this place. So they had a jar, they had a light, and they had a, a trumpet. I'm a visual type of guy. And so please just entertain me for a second, if you will. Please just stand to your feet if you can. So we're gonna do this together. <clears throat> See, the Bible says that what? They, they took the jar. Everyone take the jar, take your jar in your right hand in your right hand and they 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 smash the jar on the floor just smash your jar it's good good sound effects down the front thank you <laughs> and then out of the jar they took the torch and they lifted up the torch with their left hand so just just lift up your torch with your left hand if you will let me just explain something about this moment and about this picture right here the left hand in these moments, in this time of history that we look at, would represent weakness. And so what they were displaying right here 
is that I don't have to hide my weakness. But when I am weak, then I am strong. And all the more, I'm going to boast about my weakness so that what? Christ's power may rest on me. Now, I'm not just saying, well, this is my weakness. It's just how it is. It's just me. Boo-boo, deal with it. But no, here I am, as weak as anything. But you know what? I'm living under the power of Christ. I'm living in the Holy Spirit. I'm living with God's power in my life. So I'm going to declare God's power over my weakness. I don't have to live in fear, but I can live victorious. And then what did they do? They took the trumpet and they blew the trumpet. Everyone blow your trumpet in this place. Oh, come on, blow your trumpet in this place. And the Bible says, come on, keep your left hands up. Keep your left hands up. The Bible says with their right hand, they lifted up the trumpet. What position do we find ourselves in? <laughs> What position do we find ourselves in? A position of surrender and a position of worship. The only way they're going to defeat their battles, the only way they're going to face the biggest things in their life is if they surrender everything to the King of Kings and they begin to lift up some worship to Him. How beautiful is that? That whatever it is that you are facing in your life, whether it is an abusive parent, whether it is financial difficulty, whether it is marriage difficulties, whatever it is that you are facing in your life, you have the power of worship to overcome every single battle, every single opposition, every single thing that you face. But the question is, will you be a worshiper? I don't want to be a warrior anymore. I want to be a worshiper. I don't want to live in fear anymore. God, I want to live in how you're telling me that I can just come to your throne room, look up to your name and see your face and worship you. I wonder if there are any worshippers in this place. That you can just bring yourself just as you are. That when you are weak, then you are strong and you can allow Christ's power to rest upon you. And you can believe His Word and have confidence in His Word that He is who He says He is and He does what He says He's doing. And you can stand there confidently and worship Him. But here's the truth. So many of us in our lives, we feel like we've done that. If we're honest. I've been worshiping. I've been worshiping. I've been coming to church. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been trying to do the right thing. And yet, guess what, Dan? The Midianite army is still there in front of me. That sickness is still there in front of me. That financial difficulty is still there in front of me. That relationship issue is still there in front of me. I love what Gideon shouts out to his men. He says this. I want to read it to you. He says, While each man held their position around the camp, Gideon said, Stand your position. Stand your position. Stand your position. I need, I need someone to help me. Michael, come up here, help me quick. Just get your jar. Get your jar. 
if you remember. Yes, good. Smash your jaw. Good. Get the torch with your left hand. Lift it up. Good. Now get your trumpet. Blow the trumpet. <laughs> I'm so glad I picked you. <laughs> Lift up the trumpet with your right hand. Now it says that Gideon and the 300 men stood around the camp and they did exactly that as God had called them to do and asked them to do. And they stood there and they stood there, but it doesn't say how long they stood there for. It doesn't say instantly the enemy started to flee, right? It doesn't say after the first trumpet blow that the enemy started to fight against each other. It just said they stood there. But Gideon shouted out an instruction. Stand your position. Stand your position. Because sometimes in life when things aren't changing, we do not physically see change in our situations and circumstances, this position gets a little bit tired and we begin to drop. We begin to loosen up a little bit. We begin to drop and we go, you know what? Nothing's happening. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just keep one hand up. I'll just keep one hand up. I'll just be half in, half out. I love God. I'll just read a bit of the Bible, but I'm not believing anything's going to change. I'm not going to believe my circumstances are going to be any different. And we begin to live like that, and our hands begin to drop and begin to drop. But this is what I love about the power of the church, about the power of community. This is why I love that in news it's tenders to be in connect groups because community strengthens one another, that we can stand with one another, and we go, Yo, Michael, stand your position. Stand your position. I'm going to champion you. I'm going to believe with you. And this is the thing about such a diverse community. You may not be going through the same thing that someone else is going through. What their Midianite army isn't your Midianite army. But we can be able to stand one on one, arm in arm with each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and say, stand your position. I believe the same God that you believe. I'm not going through that financial gift difficulty, but I'm going to shout with you, stand your position. Stand your position. I don't know what it is that you're facing. I don't know what's going through your mind. I don't know you're getting married real soon. I don't know what things are in your head, but stand your position. Stand your position. That when things get tough, that when no one knows and all the things of life are just coming at you, stand your position. Don't drop those arms. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on His Word. Don't give up on what He's told you and what He's placed in your heart. Because if He said it, then He'll do it. And everything that tries to steal, kill, and destroy that, just get rid of it in the name of Jesus. But declare the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Stand your position. <clears throat> All right, where's this? Where's, come on. I need the voices. The angels, we call them. Is this helping anyone? So it says that they went from a place of what? Fear, Herod. <clears throat> God's teaching them to worship, to not worry, to not think that you need the things that you think you need or what society says that you need. Gideon thought he needed 32,000 men. God was saying, no, you just need a heart of worship. And it says that they end up at a place called what? Beth Barah. Beth Barah means this. It means a place of safety, a place of peace. That God had taken from a place of fear and they had ended up at a place of peace because they learned to be worshippers. They learned to submit everything to Him. And I can tell you from my testimony that God has taken me and He continues to keep taking me from places of fear to places of faith. <laughs> peace when I submit it all to Him and when I worship. And I wonder where you're at today. I wonder where you find yourself. I wonder if you are stuck at a place called fear and you're so desperately trying to get to a place called peace. Can you learn to be a worshipper? Can you learn to submit it all to Jesus today and give it to Him? 
You say, God, this is bigger than me, but it's not bigger than you. So my eyes are gonna stay on you. Just close your eyes in this place. And the worship team are gonna sing a song over us, and I don't know what song it's gonna be. But if you're in that place, then you need to worship. You need to worship. You're gonna fight your battles by worship. You don't need the sword. You don't need the shield. You don't need any of those things that everyone tells you you need, but you just need to have a worshiper's heart. So come on, let's worship, come on. I will pray.